we have with us um, Ola Omie, so she is a sex therapist and also a trained psychotherapist as well. And she helps couples and individuals discover and enjoy sexual satisfaction and fulfillment. Her training, she has a background in psychology, certifications in counseling, psychotherapy, and sexual, psychosexual therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. So she's also a member of the African Network of Professional Counselors and the lead therapist at Thriving Family International. That's an organization that is focused on providing counseling and therapy for personal and family life related areas. She has worked with over 1,000 couples and individuals over the years, helping them to achieve sexual fulfillment through one-on-one -on -one sex therapy slash coaching. Um, she also has online sex coaching courses and her sex academy as well. She calls it the University of Sex. I think that's an interesting name. She works with individuals dealing with sexual dysfunctions, such as vaginismus, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, and survivors of sexual trauma and abuse. So you can also learn more about Allow Me Eso by visiting our website, allowmeeso.com. So we would have um, Allow Me Eso now. She's going to give us her presentation on sexual myths and misconceptions. So an important thing, like we agreed, in the course of the presentation, it's you can drop your questions in the, in the chat section and then we'll take them one after the other once we are done. We'll address all questions. And like I said earlier, if you are worried about or you feel a bit shy typing on the general platform, you can actually make send private conversations or private messages. You can send them directly to me or to the IGA HMO hosts on the chat. You can just check in the, um, the participants section to search for the person you want to send the message to. So we would have, um, I'll hand over to Allow me a song to give her presentation. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Christian. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, allow me. Yeah, thanks for having me here today. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Okay, so um, I've been listening to everything um, that you said, but what exactly, I'm not seeing questions, or I'm not seeing participation and engagement. Where are all the questions, please? Ask your questions as we go so that we have an en engaging session um, as much as possible, because I like engaging with the audience as much as possible. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, Christian has done the introduction, so I don't need to introduce myself all over again. So I'll just go right into the presentation and share my screen. Okay. Can you see the presentation, please? Yes, yes, we, yes, I can. So I guess everyone can see it as well. All right. Okay, good. So we're talking about tackling common sex myths and misconceptions today. So Kristen has done the introduction. I'm not going to go into all of that again. I'm just going to say this. I am a mutual pleasure advocate. I advocate for the pleasure of both the man and the woman. Sex was not created for just one person to be the sole beneficiary. It's created for mutual pleasure. So I'm, I'm a strong mutual pleasure advocate. And um, talking about sex myths and um, all of these things, it's important to know that the things that we believe about sex, you know, affect how we perceive sex and how we approach sex. So our beliefs, our experiences, our values, all of those things, you know, go into our sexual behavior and they affect our sexual behavior alone and even with our partner. So it then makes sense to say that when um, our sexual beliefs are not right or they are based on myths or misconceptions, they can be detrimental to our sex lives. And so as we talk about this, I mean, identify which beliefs that you currently hold and try to challenge those beliefs. Do they work for you? Do they work in your relationship? Do they work in your personal life? Are they good for you or are they just detrimental to your sexual relationship? And so as we go through this, please, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so let's go into the myth number one. And this one is very popular. They say sex begins when a man is erect and ends when he ejaculates. It's not true. It's not true at all. So we, you know, a lot of us have this perception that sex is limited to intercourse. So if I came here today and I said, oh guys, I just had sex now. Chances are high that what you're thinking I've had is 
intercourse, as in penis and vagina, that's what you're thinking I've had. But the truth is that sex is beyond intercourse. Sex has to do with a whole lot of other things beyond intercourse. And when we say um, sex begins when a man is erect, it makes sex very penis focused. So it's all about the man, it's all about the penis. Whenever the man is ready, whenever the penis is erect, then it's time to start having sex. No, that's not right and that's not true. And the thing is, for, the, for a very long time, and even till date, um, women have been held to that, um, how do I put it, to that standard of if a man is erect, automatically my vagina should be ready to receive him. And it's not right. It's not true because a man can be erect. If, if you look at how a man's um, sexual cycle goes, a man goes from flaccid to erect. A man can go from flaccid to erect in a very short time. So men, they've not even done anything. Just by kissing, the man is already erect. And for a woman, it might take more time. And so thinking that sex should begin when a man is erect is a belief that is faulty because it talks about, it addresses the readiness of the man to have sex, but not the readiness of the woman to have sex. So there's something that we call the point of pleasurable penetration. And what happens at that point is when a woman's body is ready for, for penetration as an in intercourse, not just sex, now intercourse, when a woman's body is ready for intercourse, her vagina expands, it lengthens, her cervix moves up in preparation. Blood flow increases, she gets wet in preparation. If those things have not happened, if her body has not gotten to the point of pleasurable penetration and the man penetrates simply because he's erect, it's highly likely that it will not be, it will not be pleasurable for the woman. And so sex begins right from when you are preparing yourself, not just when it's time for intercourse. It doesn't mean that when the man is erect, we should go in. The woman's body also has to be ready for intercourse. And it does not end when he ejaculates. When he ejaculates, yes, for him, he may, I mean, for him, he might have gotten to that point of the height of sexual fulfillment, orgasm, ejaculation, and what have you. But if the lady hasn't gotten there, it has not ended. If she's not such, as a matter of fact, I say that sex ends when both partners decide that it has ended, which means that you can have intercourse, you can have sex, foreplay, and all of those things together. And even before intercourse, somebody says, you know what, I'm fine. And it's okay. Or you have, I mean, everything progresses, foreplay and all of that progresses to intercourse and nobody has an orgasm, but both of you decide that you are okay. It's absolutely fine. Sex ends and begins when the couple decides that it's done, not according to a very penis-focused approach to sex that says when it's erect, it's done, when he ejaculates. Because what you find most times is most men will just ejaculate and the woman is not done. She's not even halfway there. And because he has ejaculated, he just leaves her and he just says, oh, baby, we are done. You just roll over. And most likely he will sleep, you know? And the woman is just there feeling like, oh, I haven't even gotten my pleasure. Or probably she was even just getting in the groove. Do you understand? And the thing is, when things like that happen, it can make the sexual experience very, very frustrating for the woman. So when a man ejaculates, it's fine. Nothing is wrong with him ejaculating. But if your woman is not there yet, if she hasn't enjoyed, if she, if she hasn't gotten that fulfillment that she needs at that point in time, you want to help her um, also get fulfillment and pleasure by stimulating other areas. And when I say fulfillment and pleasure, my focus is not necessarily orgasm. I'm just saying that when she feels that she's, she's enjoyed it and she's fulfilled. And so explore other areas of stimulation, manual stimulation, using your hand, what we popularly call fingering, if she's open to that, oral sex, whatever it is that she enjoys, help her also get there. So don't think that sex just ends once you ejaculate. So I mean, that definitely, I mean, that perception of sex is very, very penis focused, not taking into account how a woman's body works, not taking into account the fact that for a woman's body to even get to the point of pleasurable penetration to start with, it goes through a process, like her body has to go through a process. Vaginal tenting has to happen for her to be ready to receive the penis. And even when he ejaculates, if she's not, if she feels that she hasn't gotten there, even if she feels that she wants to orgasm, which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that. The man shouldn't just stop it simply because he has ejaculated and he just rolls over and says, baby, we are done, Mwah, good night, that kind of thing. No, it doesn't work like that. If she insists that she wants to also have an orgasm, I, I believe that um, the man should also 
work through stimulating her through other means. As a matter of fact, I tell people, I say, look, you can have sex even without an erection. Even without an erection. In fact, that when I tell people that, it seems very, very funny. But I'm even right now, I'm even saying you can have intercourse even before a man is fully erect. Yeah. And what happens is a soft penis. I mean, I don't know why people are very afraid of a soft penis. A soft penis can actually go into the vagina. Is uh, they use this term to describe it. it's called stuffing. It's a very undignified term. They call it stuffing. But the truth is that a soft penis can actually go into the vagina. It can go in, especially in positions where the woman is in more control. So a soft penis can actually slip into the vagina. And, you know, stimulation can continue even through intercourse. And you, what you find is that gradually the man's erection begins to come. The man's erection begins to happen. His penis begins to lengthen and get more erect while he's already inside. And I tell people this, look, don't focus so much on the erection. You can have even intercourse without... You can start intercourse even without a full erection. You can have intercourse even without an erection. Once you put it in, the, the more the woman stimulates, the more the penis then gets the, um, starts to get erect. And honestly, it can be very pleasurable too because you know when the penis goes from flaccid to erect, while inside the vagina, it can be highly pleasurable because it goes through a process and she goes through a process of feeding a soft penis and gradually it gets harder, it gets harder. So basically the penis lengthens while inside the vagina and it can even be very pleasurable for both of them. So, I mean, intercourse doesn't even have to, um, you don't even have to have an erection to start intercourse as a matter of fact. Sex does not begin when a man is erect. A woman's body also has to be ready for penetration, um, for intercourse. Sex is not limited to intercourse. Um, sex as a whole does not end when he ejaculates. So I hope that um, you understand that. I hope that, I, I hope this myth, I hope this myth has been disabused in your mind and helps you um, have a better understanding or an expanded understanding of what sex can look like when we're using a more inclusive approach to, um, to look at sex as opposed to a penis-focused penis approach. So I'm going to be going to the next one. Myth number two. Yes. So a lot of people make this mistake. The vagina and the vulva are the same. No, they are not. The vulva is the external part of um, the female genitalia. And so I have, I have an image somewhere. So don't, let me see. I should be able to show that image. Yes. So this is, this is the vulva. This diagram here is not the vagina. This canal, the muscular canal that actually goes inside is what we call the vagina. This entirety here, the entirety of the external female genitalia is the vulva. And the interesting thing is that um, a lot of women don't even have relationships with their vulvas. They don't even know what it looks like. I mean, some women don't even actually know that you have three holes. Some women even think that you they pee from the vagina. It's not true. There's the urethral opening. So I hope you can see this diagram properly. So this is the clitoris. So the vulva um, comprises of the clitoris, the labia majora, which is the fleshy um, lips on the outer part, the labia minora. You have the urethral opening. You have the clitoris. You have the anus. And then you have this patch of skin between um, the um, vaginal opening and the anus is what we call the perineum. You have the perineum as well. So the entirety of the external female genitalia is the vulva, not the vagina. So what you're looking at right now is not the vagina. This canal here is the vagina. Yeah. So the vagina itself is the muscular canal, not, I mean, not the entire um, female genitalia. And I want to say this, your vagina is self-cleansing. Please don't go putting things inside your vagina. Don't go putting, um, what's it called? There's some things, some herbs that they, they say you can put in your vagina. It will clean it for you. No, your vagina doesn't need cleaning. It cleanses itself. It's a self-cleaning organ. Your vagina doesn't need anything. You don't have to put anything to clean your vagina. They will tell you, put something inside. It will clean it. It will do this. It will do that. No. You're going to mess with the flora and fauna of your vagina. And you can actually ha start having infections just by doing that. So your vagina is self-cleansing. What is not self-cleansing is your vulva. Your vulva is not self-cleansing. Please, 
understand this. When they say vagina is soft, because we think vagina is everything, we think, oh, everything is soft. I don't need to clean. No, please. Your vulva is not self-cleansing. Your vulva can actually begin to smell. Your vulva can begin to smell funky if you do not clean it. And when you clean your vulva, you don't even, you can use mild soap, but even without mild soap, water is fine. You can use water to rinse your vulva thoroughly every time when you take your bath, when you pee and all of that. But putting your hand inside the vagina, please, you have no business going there. Your vagina is not, um, does not need anything to clean. You don't need to put your hand to scoop anything, please. Your vagina is a self-cleansing organ. If anything should be in your vagina, the penis, maybe sex toys, if you're into sex toys, and stuff like that. Sometimes, yes, you can put your hand if you're trying to um, do a process of self-discovery and all of that, but clean hands still. Even if your partner is fingering you, clean hands still. Please, your vagina is a self-cleansing organ. Don't put soap in your vagina. Don't put um, herbs in your vagina. Don't put anything, you know, that can mess the flora and fauna of your vagina inside your vagina. Your vulva is what needs to be cleaned. So feminine wash, your mild soap, simply water, is fine in cleaning your vulva, please. Again, I'm gonna say this in case you haven't seen this before. Your vulva has three openings. This is the urethra opening where urine comes from. This is the vagina where the penis goes through and where your period blood comes from. And this is the anus. I'm sure everybody already knows what the anus does. And so basically that is that about the vagina and the vulva. I hope that this clears out some misunderstandings on that front. Um, Christian, are you here? Yes, I'm with you. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> I'm just not very used to very silent, very silent but, presentation. So I, I, it, well, it's fine, it's fine. So the third myth, vaginal orgasms are superior to other orgasms. That, that is just not true. So I get a lot of women come to me and say, oh, I don't orgasm, I don't orgasm. And by the time I ask them questions, you, you find that they actually have clitoral orgasms, but they don't have vaginal orgasms. So all those I don't orgasm, I don't orgasm, they're saying, they're saying I don't have vaginal orgasms. That's the subtext of what a lot of people are trying to say. They have clitoral orgasms, but they disregard it and say, I don't orgasm once I don't have vaginal orgasms. A lot of people, and again, it beca it's because they start um, penis focused um, approach to sex. So we believe that when, when, when a penis goes into a vagina, it is a man using his penis that has the superpower to give a woman vaginal orgasms. So that is how a woman is, should be. That is what is normal. It is when the penis is in the vagina that a woman should be able to have an orgasm and she should be able to have vaginal orgasms. That's a good way to actually have orgasms. If you are focused on having orgasms while your partner is inside you, a good way to have um, orgasms is while you are having um, penile stimulation, while um, the penis is inside the vagina, the man or even the woman herself can stimulate the clitoris. And that also can bring about orgasms while the penis is inside. So, I mean, the point of this is to say that vaginal orgasms are not superior to any type of orgasm. Any type of orgasm you have, enjoy it. Now, does it mean that you can never have other types of orgasm? No, it, you can. It does take a bit of exploration of discovering your body, which is something that a lot of people don't do. So a lot of people don't um, really take the time to explore their bodies or even explore their bodies with their partner because, we're, again, we are focused on intercourse, intercourse, intercourse. The man is erect, he ejaculates. Oh, it's fine. But the truth is that a woman's body has so much um, potential for pleasure. The clitoris alone has 8,000 nerve endings. The clitoris alone has 8,000 nerve endings. The penis that men always carry on their head like World Cup, my penis, my penis, my penis, has about 4,000 nerve endings. So imagine you that you're a woman. It's God that created you. Your clitoris has 8,000 nerve Sorry? Why did you say like World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> yes, now men always shouting, my penis, my penis. <laughs> wow, so, wow. <laughs> So, I mean, 8,000 nerve endings. Your body, you as a, as a woman, you have so much potential for pleasure. But that shame of culture, that shame of, oh, I don't want to explore, I don't want to know. To, I mean, Kristen said something about when a woman um, knows a lot about sex, people, um, she, um, men may perceive, or people may perceive that, oh, this person is loose. 
No, there's nothing wrong with knowing your body. There's nothing wrong with knowing the unique way that you receive pleasure because that is unique to you. And you have pleasure is your best right. So explore your body to know how you can have better orgasms. You can even have blended orgasms. So there's so much more that you can explore. There's so much potential that a woman's body is capable of. So there's so much pleasure potential that a woman's body is capable of that. When we focus on just one way, honestly, we are just cheating ourselves. Now, the fourth myth I want to talk about is that, this is the one that says for sex to be satisfying, it must go beyond one round. In fact, this is very, this is very, very interesting because um, I think about, this came to my notice about two or three years ago when people would message me and say, well, um, I'm enjoying sex or I'm not enjoying sex because it doesn't go beyond one round. At first, I didn't understand. I'm like, what's going on? Go beyond one round. What do you mean by that? Uh, like, and we're only able to do one round. And I'm not just talking men, no. even women too. They're saying, I don't know what's going on. I'm only able to do one round. After one round, I'll be tired. Ah. And then I'm wondering that what exactly is going on here? It was, and so when I, I did a bit of a poll to find out what people were thinking about this one round thing, Apparently, a lot of people think that one round is just the appetizer. And then maybe like when you go second, third round, that's when you, now we're talking. Please don't go and kill yourself. For sex to be satisfying, it does not have to go beyond one round, though, please. One round is fine. There's nothing wrong with having one round <laughs> of sex that is satisfying for both of you. A sexual experience that, both, that the man enjoys, the woman enjoys, that both of you enjoy. One, and I'm sure and when people say one round, they, they measure it with orgasm. So you have one round, um, you have um, you go through the play two phase and everything and orgasm, that's one round. Then you experience to go another round. As a matter of fact, for a man, the refractory period, actually in, as, you, as you age, in younger men, the refractory period might be short. So in younger men, maybe in five minutes, you can get another erection. But as, you, as men age, the refractory period gets longer. You find that some men, say, if they have sex now, some are not even able to get it up to the next day. So as, the, as men get older, and also depending on their lifestyle, you find that the refractory period can get longer. Women, it's easier because, I mean, women can have an orgasm, women can have multiple orgasms, women can still be stimulated and all of that. But the truth is that what I'm trying to say in essence is, please do not put yourself under pressure to go beyond one round. There's no, there's absolutely no rule book. It really bothers me that a lot of people are so rigid about sex. We keep looking for rules and regulation. Sex should be defined for yourself. Understand the way that you and your partner receive pleasure and work with what you have. It does not have to go beyond one round. You don't want to kill yourself. If you are someone who enjoys one round, your refractory period, yeah, you are, okay, you are okay one round, you want to go more. It's okay, it's okay if you and your partner are fine with it. But one round is not a must. There's no rule book that says sex must go beyond one round. One round is not an appetizer, it's a full experience. So please, don't kill yourself because you want to go more than one round. You're just suffering yourself, especially when it's, it's, it's not working for you. Don't kill yourself about it. One round is enough. It's not about proving virility. You can have sex, it's pleasurable for you. As a matter of fact, some women even say that when the man keeps going on and on and on, because what happens is that when the woman is not even enjoying it again, she dries up and then it can start to get painful and the man keeps going on and on. And for him, he thinks it's proving virility. Yeah, I'm a womb shifter. That's how we do. No, that's not how stars do. Please, one round can be enough. If it's satisfying for you and your partner, one round is absolutely fine. So please don't go and enjoy yourself saying you want to do multiple rounds. If but if you and your partner are fine with it, fantastic. But it is not in any, there's no rule book. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that says that sex must go beyond one round if it has to be satisfying. Then myth number five. Um, Kristen, are we still okay like this or should I keep sharing my screen or just proceed like this? Let, let's proceed like this for now. Okay, okay, all right, then it's fine. So um, myth number five, circumcised women can never enjoy sex. So this one, I'm gonna do a bit of explaining. So there are different types of circumcision. Some, a portion of the clitoris is cut, 
some, the clitoris and the labia, so, so the, a portion of the clitoris and even the labia is also cut as well. Some forms of circumcision, they just throw the labia together to kind of close the vagina. Um, so there's just a little hole for um, menstruation blood to come out, but, in but the vagina has largely been closed. Do you understand? Um, and honestly, circumcision is a very traumatic process. It's, it's a very traumatizing experience for people that go through it. It's very, very traumatizing. It is, it is, it is actually, it's now sexual abuse. It's child sexual abuse, sexual abuse now. Um, circumcising a woman is wrong. As a child, as a baby, as an adult, circumcision is wrong. And I mean, this is just, is, now we call it female genital mutilation. Now that's what it's called. So it's, it's a very traumatizing experience, yeah? And honestly, it can cause women not to want sex, not to desire sex. It can cause sexual pain. It can cause a lot of issues with even, the, with even how a woman feels in her body. So a woman who is experiencing pain during sex cannot enjoy sex. A woman whose clitoris have been cut off at some point, I'll, I'll explain more of that. But what I'm trying to say um, is the process of circumcision is a very traumatizing process. It's, a, it's not a good thing um, to be done to women and it can actually have um, consequences in terms of how women feel in their body when it comes to sex and intercourse and all of that. Having said that, no, there are actually, um, what do I call it? There are some women who have no real, maybe they were circumcised as babies. So there's no real um, memory of that experience. Do you understand? Just like when you circumcise boys as babies, they don't really, they don't remember what happened. They just see their pain and they think, oh, this is what a normal penis looks like and all of that. So for women who don't have that recollection of the trauma, who were circumcised as babies and what have you, what I've come to notice is that for a lot of those women, the block, and women, so women who don't have that memory of trauma, who, who don't feel any kind of pain or negative um, physiological response when their vaginas or their vulvas are touched, what I've come to understand or what I've come to find is that for a lot of these women, it's um, purely psychological. So there are some women that just feel like, oh, I don't enjoy sex. And why am I not enjoying sex? And maybe you ask their parents and they say, oh, you were circumcised. So they tie it together. Yeah. And I think that some of that tying together is a bit, can be a bit premature. It then becomes like a, a okay, so I'm not enjoying sex. Well, I heard I'm circumcised. So definitely circumcision must have been the reason, circumcision must be the reason why I'm not enjoying sex. So it then becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy because they've seen a reason that they've held on to. Now, please understand when I say this, this is not for people who have a recollection of what happened or the trauma or the pain. This is not for people who actually experience physical pain. No, this is for, um, when, I, when I say this now, I'm saying in terms of people who cannot even remember the trauma, people who don't have any physical pain or anything when they have intercourse and all of that, what usually happens is that the block is more mental than even physical. So knowing that, oh, I've been circumcised, it then means I won't enjoy sex. It becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy and they actually do not enjoy sex. So basically that's what happens for a lot of people. That mental block is there. And we all know that the mind is the greatest, is your greatest sex organ. If, you, if, you, if you've held on to that notion that you cannot enjoy sex, trust me, you won't enjoy it, even if you're not circumcised. You won't enjoy it. So for circumcised women, well, can it be a bit more difficult or a bit more tricky to navigate um, their, their, um, what's their sexual responses? It could. Do you understand? So, so for someone whose clitoris, for instance, has not been caught, oh, it can easily be stimulated and she enjoys it. For, some, so for a woman whose clitoris has been cut off, so we know that the clitoris is a, is a lot more than what we see on the outside. Yeah? Pleasure is still possible. That's what I'm trying to say. Pleasure is still possible, but it takes a lot of patience, which we don't have, or which we have been trained not to have, because we think that if something is not working, something is wrong with me. If this thing doesn't, if I try it once, it's not working, something is wrong with me. If I try it, if my partner tries something, it doesn't work, something is wrong. We just rule out things really, really fast. I have worked with circumcised women who are now able to enjoy sex. The block was largely mental. The block was largely psychological. But patience had to happen. We had to be patient to explore. When you also have a partner who is patient with you to explore, it helps. Again, remember that sexual arousal, that feeling of sexual arousal, 
the subjective feeling of sexual arousal is possible without even going anywhere near the vagina. Kissing can get somebody, can get a woman aroused. So since we're talking about women, kissing can get a woman aroused. Sucking her breast can get her aroused. Stroking her body, giving her an erotic massage, what have you, can get her aroused even without going near her vagina. And so she is not incapable of feeling sexual arousal. What some people then complain of is feeling around the vaginal area. They don't, they say, oh, I don't really feel anything. I don't enjoy anything. But the thing is that a lot of them, the women that I've worked with, we found that with patients, yeah, they were able to navigate their bodies and understand how they could receive pleasure. Sorry? Today is an interruption. Please, everyone, if you're just joining in, you can just mute yourself. So we don't interrupt the presentation. All right. Can I go on? Yes, yes, you can. Okay, all right. So circumcised women can enjoy sex. They have the potential, it's still there, they can enjoy sex. But what happens in most cases, especially with those who don't even have a recollection of the trauma or just who are just told that you are circumcised, what happens in most cases is that there's a mental block that has to be done away with. Uh, the women I've worked with, circumcised, are now able to enjoy sex fully. Honestly, it did take a lot of patience. It did take a lot of going through some psychosexual processes and all of that, but it's possible. It is absolutely possible. And so I'm just going to, I mean, even for women who, who um, remember the trauma of being circumcised, that's what therapy is for, because it's trauma. That's what therapy is for. It can still help these women to get to a place to heal. I mean, even um, psychologically and to get to a place where they are open to enjoying sex again. But the problem is that a lot of people just want to jump from wherever they are to, you know, just, I, sh I should automatically, instinctively be able to enjoy sex. It doesn't work like that for everybody. Even for people who, are not, who have not been circumcised, some people are still, I haven't still figured out how their body, how the unique ways in which their body receives pleasure. So all of this, with all of this comes a lot of patience and going through the process. And it also really, really helps when women have partners that are also patient with, their, patient with them and ready to help them walk through the process of understanding and accepting their own pleasure again. So myth number six, yes. So all men have a high sexual libido. Okay, so this is not true. Um, I you can start sharing, you can share your screen again. Okay, all right. Um, also, just note, like all the questions being asked, we'll take them at the end okay. so that we don't interrupt the presentation and we're able to finish, yes. So just okay. keep dropping your questions. Okay, all right. So let me start sharing my screen again. Okay. So myth number six, all men have high sexual libidos. Yes, yeah, that's where we are. So can you see my screen now? Okay. Yes, I can, yes, I can. Okay, okay, great. So, so myth number six, all men have high sexual libidos. That is absolutely false. And so that's what we call um, spontaneous and responsive libido. Now, what society has made us to think, to believe, to understand is that every man has a high libido for sex. Every man wants sex. If, if a naked woman walks past a man, oh, his penis will just be erect, he's ready to go, he's ready to just have sex, you know, all men initiate sex, they do all of those things. But in reality, that is not true. That's what we call the spontaneous libido and what we call the responsive libido. Now, the spontaneous libido um, is what we see as normal or is what we're told to understand as normal, where desire precedes arousal. So we think that, oh, you can have a, a desire for sex. So you just have, you just think of something, you just have a desire for sex, just comes up and then you are aroused and then you go to your woman and you're like, oh yeah, baby, let's do this. But the truth is that not all men have that kind of libido. There is what we call the responsive libido. Now, this applies to even both men and women. That's what we call the responsive libido, whereby arousal precedes desire, which means that for people who have a responsive, just like the name says, responsive, their own desire, their own sexual desire 
will respond to something arousing them first. It then means that, okay, that thing has started again. Okay. So it then means that people who have a responsive libido can actually go without sex. It doesn't mean that they don't like sex. So get me right. They enjoy sex when they have it, but they might not come and initiate it. Why? Because nothing has happened to arouse sexual desire in them. Remember, if you are spontaneous, sexual desire can come up in, in you spontaneously. You can just have that desire for sex, it's tingling in your body, and then you are good to go, yeah? But for those who are responsive, they can go without sex. When they have sex, they enjoy it. And this is what happens when you see a lot of people say, ah, my partner does not initiate. But when I go, when I initiate, they enjoy it. And, I'm, and I keep wondering, why don't they initiate? Why don't they initiate? For the most part, you would find that people like that very highly likely have what we call a responsive libido. When they have sex, they enjoy it. But sexual desire is not spontaneous. It will not just come up in them. Something has to arouse sexual desire in them. That's why we say they have a responsive libido. So if nothing arouses sexual desire in them, sexual desire is not going to come up spontaneously. Do you understand? And so there are men and women like this. Our belief is that all men will have this spontaneous kind of response where they just have an automatic desire for sex and they say, oh, baby, come here and all of that. But the truth is that some men are responsive. Unfortunately, because society has made us to think that, oh, men have spontaneous libidos and all of that. If you then have a partner, a man, who is not so gung-ho about sex, you are wondering, ah, something must be wrong with this person. Something must be wrong. And when we have sex, you enjoy it, but you never initiate. Something is wrong. You're not behaving like a real man. And such men are shamed. It is not right, please. If your man, if your partner, your male partner has a responsive libido, it is just another way that a libido can exist. It is not abnormal. If he has a spontaneous libido, fantastic. If he has a responsive libido, fantastic. But you need to understand, if you don't understand that there's something called a responsive libido or that men can have a responsive libido, you'll be fighting with your man all the time. You don't initiate sex. You don't have, am I not attracted to you? Don't you like me anymore? And what have you? But the truth is that there are men that have spontaneous and um, responsive libidos. So not all men have high spontaneous um, desires for sex. Some men have responsive libido. And same thing happens to women too. Some women have spontaneous um, sexual desires where they just want sex, you know, they can demand for it anytime. They just feel it and they want it. Meanwhile, a, now a lot of women also have responsive libidos. But I mean, to a certain extent, in, in women, it has been permitted, so to speak, even without knowing what it is, there's a lot, there's a bit of room, wiggle room to say, eh, sometimes women don't like sex. It's not true. Some women actually have responsive libido and some women have spontaneous. But for men, the general consensus of what we think it should be is that men should just have spontaneous libidos, but it's not true. Some men have responsive libidos. It then means that you need to understand what can arouse your man to bring about sexual desire in him. What has, what, I mean, what does he respond to sexually? If you understand that, trust me, you have solved it. You will not keep going on and on about, oh, I'm the only one that initiates. Because then you would understand what he responds to and how to set the plans in motion, how to set the sequence of, I mean, bringing up sexual desire in your mind. You will know how to set it in motion as opposed to sitting there and complaining all the time. My man does not like me. He does not have a sexual, um, he does, he's not attracted to me. What have you, what have you. So basically, again, not all men have spontaneous libidos. Some men have responsive libidos. If you know how to navigate it, you would not have that problem. Not all men have, you know, not all men will just see women and they will jump on them. Not all men will see you naked and want to have sex right then. Not all men are like that. So the, se the seventh one, number seven, me, um, number seven me says sex is a one size fits all and everybody should enjoy sex the same way. No, that's not true as well, because we are all unique individuals and we're unique in the way that our bodies receive pleasure. Not all women, amazingly, not all women enjoy even nipple stimulation. Because remember, when we say sex, we're not just saying intercourse, we're saying everything, the totality of everything that brings you sexual pleasure is what we call sex right now. So not just intercourse. Some women don't enjoy nipple stimulation. Some women will, uh, will die for it. Some women will not, some women are actually orgasm from nipple stimulation. Some women don't want it at all. They don't enjoy it. Some, um, some men don't like oral sex. 
yes, you might be hearing blowjob, blowjob, oh, blowjob, drive his mind wild and everything. True, but not every man actually enjoys blowjobs. So don't think that everybody has to fit into a mold. Same thing, not every woman enjoys conilingus. It's not every woman that enjoys you sucking her vagina, sucking her vulva and all of that, licking her feet and what. Not every woman enjoys it. It's not a one size fits all. You need to understand what works for you. How does your own pleasure come about? What is your pleasure map? What gives you pleasure? And it's absolutely fine because I think life would be it would be very boring if everybody enjoyed sex the same way. Nothing to discover, just the same thing. But I mean, this gives room for you to be able to discover things with your partner to say, okay, what do you enjoy? What don't you enjoy? Not everybody enjoys vaginal stimulation, as we've said before. You have to go on a journey of self and sexual discovery with your partner. Some, um, not every, I, I mean, at the same time, not every enjoys it, not, not everybody enjoys a finger of the bum. So it's not everything that is trending that you must do, please. So recently, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you've been hearing a lot of time, um, so a lot of people are making, um, what's it called, anal sex is trending a lot now. A lot of people are exploring it. Some people like it, men and women, yes, now. Some people like it, some don't, and it's okay not to. Some people explore with um, um, anal sex toys, butt plugs, or try to put a finger up the bum. For some men, putting a finger up, the, up his bum to stimulate his prostate can be very, very pleasurable. For some men, their bum is a no-go area. Do not touch my anus, it's a no-go area. Do you understand? And same thing applies to women. So please, don't just see things and think that, oh, because people are, because this thing is popular, we must do it, we must try, we must enjoy it. No, you might not enjoy it. And that's just the truth. That's just the truth. So sex is not a one size fits all. You have to understand how you receive pleasure, understand your pleasure map, pleasure maps and that of your partner as well. As I mean, those are the things that make your, uh, your sexual experience and sexual relationship beautiful and enjoyable and unique to both of you. So sex is not a one size fits all at all. And everyone doesn't have to enjoy sex the same way. Now, Myth number eight says that sex is solely for the man's pleasure. Again, this is just a myth. Interestingly, when, when the year 2020, and a lot of us females say, oh, we are woke, we are woke, we are woke. Yes, we are woke. This is the work that I do. So I interface with a lot of couples, a lot of individuals and all of that. And I will tell you that even in this year 2020, I still have a lot of women come to me to say, please, I don't enjoy sex, I'm just doing it for my man. I'm just doing it for my husband. So he will not go outside. He will not do this. So a lot of, I mean, a lot of people have been, a lot of women have been socialized to think, even women now, not even just men, even women have been socialized to think that sex is for the man's pleasure. You will go to weddings today in this 2020 and some person at the wedding will say, hey, now you are married though, madam. Sex, anytime your husband asks for it, give it to him or huh, don't starve him or Give him, even if it's in the midnight, even if, nobody actually tells the man to say, Oga, this is your woman. Make sure you are giving her sexual pleasure. As a matter of fact, both of you, make sure both of you are enjoying sex together. Don't leave it to her. Don't leave it to him. You know, both of you enjoy. Do you understand? Nobody really comes out to say that. People just keep saying things like, hey, madam, give your man sex. So if not, he will run away. If not, he will go outside. If not, trust me, if your partner is going outside for anything, I mean, it speaks to the person's character as opposed to what you are able or unable to give. And when people believe things like this that say sex is holy, if a man believes it and a woman believes it, it's very dangerous for your sexual relationship. If a man believes it, he is going for sex with the intent of I'm going to get my pleasure and I'm getting out. If a woman believes it, she's having sex, but she is detached because she feels it's just for him. Let me just do it for him. There is no investment in her own pleasure. And interestingly, sometimes women are the ones that have, I've met couples in, 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 I've met couples where the woman has this belief that sex is solely for the man's pleasure. But the man is even the one that is saying, look, I, yes, I know I want to have pleasure, but I want you to have it too. But when the woman then approaches it, I, just come and do what you want to do and go. The fact that she's not enjoying it even diminishes the man's pleasure. In a lot of cases, I've met a lot of couples like that. The fact that the woman is not even enjoying it diminishes pleasure for the man. So it just becomes a mechanical process, not a shared experience where they connect. So please understand that sex is not solely for the man's pleasure. I'm a mutual pleasure advocate, like I said before, sex is for 
mutual pleasure, both the man and the woman. I've said it before, women have an amazing potential for pleasure when it comes to sexual pleasure, amazing potential. Of course, men also have, if I don't, I don't even think I need to say it because men, when it comes to sexual pleasure, men are very, how do I put it, very, very connected with that. For, for the most part, I mean, if, even if you look at it, if you look at kids, even male children, boys, from the age of one, two, three, they're always touching their penises. They are so connected. Like, it's not even about um, sexual pleasure anymore. It is just, I call it a friendship. They just have that relationship with their penis, that just to be touching it every time. You see some men, they're walking on the road, they're parking and they're bouncing. They just have a very good relationship with their penises, platonic relationship in the first place. And then, yes, a relationship that relates to sexual pleasure and all of that. But you see women, we don't, if, you, if you see a little girl touching her vagina, people will start saying, oh, maybe she's been abused. So maybe something has happened to her. She's watching something wrong. Do you understand? So women are very dissociated from their own vaginas, their vulvas, sexual pleasure, and what have you, while men tend to be quite connected to theirs. So it's easy for a man to pursue his pleasure. Do you understand? But for women, in the first place, there's this culture of shame, and then there's a dissociation from your vulva and your own sexual organs, the, the part of some part of your body that can even give you pleasure. There's a dissociation in the first place. And then you now keep hearing messages, messages saying it's for the man, it's for the man, just do it for him, just do it for him. It's dangerous because it has the potential to be very, very limiting to your sex life. You can just be doing having sex for the man's pleasure and no pleasure for you. And as human beings, I say this, we are either running towards pleasure or away from pain. So if a woman is not getting pleasure from sex, there's no motivation to have it. So she can postpone sex from now till next year. There's no motivation because there's nothing in it for her, except, of course, the man's pleasure. So she will do it because, let me just do it so that this man will not be looking outside. But there's no real pleasure for her. So there's no real motivation to want it or to even want more of it. So um, I hope that myth has been disabused to say that sex is not just for the man's pleasure, it's for mutual pleasure. Now, number nine. Hi. Sorry? Can you try sharing your screen again? Okay. Okay. Is it possible that some people who are not supposed to be here have, have been able to gain access to the meeting? That's why um, all of those messages are coming in. We, we are, we've sorted it out. Okay. All right. So it's better now, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. So number nine, myth number nine, sex is only complete when you have an orgasm. Again, because of the way we define sex, I mean, even when you look at how sex is defined in terms of the sexual, um, sexual cycle, sexual response cycle, it goes arousal, desire, play to an orgasm. So orgasm now feels like, oh, it always has to be an orgasm. It's been defined as it has to follow this route. And so it ends in orgasm. And that's when it's complete. But the truth is that it is not, excuse me. I mean, the destination is great. Having orgasms are fantastic. It's great. But the truth, the truth is that even without orgasms, you can have sex that is amazingly pleasurable. Not having an orgasm does not mean that you are missing something. Now, let me say this. If you're someone who is soft, um, who has issues with anorgasmia, where you're unable to orgasm, so that's another issue entirely. What I'm trying to say here is you're someone who orgasms, I mean, regularly, but you then see orgasm as the hallmark of sexual completion. That's not true. That sometimes you don't orgasm, but you enjoy the journey. So there is no, it's not, it's not, I mean, again, it, it brings us to how we're very rigid about when we talk about sex. We're very rigid about it. So orgasm is not the completion. The journey is just as important. And the journey does not necessarily have to end with an orgasm because you can enjoy the journey so much and you're fine. You can actually move from play to face to resolution without having an orgasm. Nothing's going to happen to you. You can be fine without orgasms. What happens is when people then begin to focus on orgasm, 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 it brings in issues around performance anxiety. And trust me, when you are having sex and you're in that place to face, if you then begin to become anxious because you are thinking, am I going to orgasm? Am I not going to orgasm? What happens is that your body's arousal response reverses and changes to an anxiety response. 
because you are thinking orgasm, orgasm, orgasm. Your focus has gone away from the pleasure in the moment, and then you are focusing on something you think that you should have, and now you are distracted and you are anxious as opposed to enjoying the journey. There's so much, there's so much to be enjoyed in the sexual journey, touching, kissing, stroking. I mean, there's just so much to be enjoyed. Because of the way I define sex that is not limited to intercourse, there's so much you can do. There's so much. Sometimes I just sit down with my husband and I just stroke him. And he still qualifies as sex to me, even if he hasn't touched me. So I think that a lot of people need to redefine sex for themselves. A lot of people need to be able to expand their definition of sex to understand that sex, the journey itself, is more important than any orgasm that you're going to have. Orgasms are great, don't get me wrong, but that should not be the focus. And it does not mean that when you have an orgasm, sex is only complete. No, you can have sex, enjoy everything, and not have an orgasm, but still feel great. So please, Focusing on orgasm, orgasm, orgasm can actually lead you to have issues around anxiety because you are thinking, number, number one, it can lead you to have issues around, around anxiety because you are thinking, oh, am I going to orgasm? Am I not going to orgasm? Number two, it can actually then cause you not to be able to focus on the experience and the pleasure that you are getting because you are still thinking of one orgasm somewhere that you want to have. So please understand that sex, and I said it earlier, sex is complete when the couple decide that it is complete. It's not about orgasm. It's not about rigidity. It's not about thinking of sex in terms of black and white and something that is inside a box that you must, you must adhere to. Whatever works for you is absolutely great. So number 10, myth number 10, if a couple love each other. Sorry? Sorry, Aaron, it was a mistake. I think someone okay. mistakenly. Okay, it's fine, it's fine. So myth number 10, if a couple love each other, sex will automatically be great. Well, this is not true. And I think I, I mentioned this before. It is not true because you were different people. And you know what is interesting, especially in our society, there's this perception of don't have sex before marriage. They don't even want you to talk about sex before marriage. That perception exists. They don't want you to have conversations around sex even before marriage. But when you get married, is expected automatically. There's no transition process. People just expect you to be able to know how to have sex, know how to do sex, even without any transition at all. So there's this expectation of, oh, because we love each other, automatically sex will be great. It's not true. Because you have to go in, you have to get through the process of knowing each other's bodies. Like I said, we are all unique. What works for one person might not work for another. Even if you've had prior sexual experience with other partners, bringing that experience into um, sex with another partner might not work because one person might like one thing, another person might not like. I mentioned before that not all women enjoy um, nipple stimulation. The person might not, the, your other partner might have enjoyed nipple stimulation and then you expect that, oh, because this person enjoyed it, this other person should enjoy it. It won't necessarily work like that. So you're using the brush that you paint of your experience to paint your current partner and it doesn't necessarily work like that. I have a friend who cannot enjoy sex if her husband has not sucked her toes. Truth, she cannot enjoy sex if her husband has not sucked her toes. Now, imagine if the husband had dated somebody who was never, never even knew anything about toe sucking, and then he just came into, the, he got married to this lady, and then he was like, they were trying to navigate sex without discovering. It would have not worked for her. They had to both explore each other to be able to get to even that point of knowing that, look, I think there's something about my toes that I enjoy. So people respond to different things. Some people enjoy, like I said, some people enjoy oral sex, some people don't. You can give oral, you might have had a partner where you used to give him fantastic blowjobs, he would orgasm and all of that, and you were like, yeah, I need a trophy at this, I'm fantastic. And then you meet somebody else, and then you think you're going to do the same thing. But the person is not even moved. The person is like, I don't really enjoy it. And you're wondering that maybe I need to go and I need to go and up my game. I need to go and check my skill level and do something that would you will just wound yourself. Maybe the person doesn't even enjoy, maybe the person doesn't even want it. Because people enjoy different things. So it will not automatically be great. You have to get through the process of knowing each other, understanding your pleasure maps, understanding what works for you, and understanding that you are unique individuals. Just take it as a blank slate. 
this is a blank slate and I need to get to know this person. This is a new terrain for me and I need to get to know this person. So it will not automatically be great. A lot of people have gone into marriage with that expectation of that sex will automatically fall into place. And it doesn't, and so they are disappointed and they just, you know, rule it, rule it out and just say, maybe I'm one of those people that don't enjoy sex. They quickly label themselves, maybe I'm a sexual. But it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Because we need to understand that sex doesn't just, great sex doesn't just happen automatically. We need to learn that each person is unique and take time to understand each other and take practice to actually have great sex. So great sex doesn't just happen like that. Myth number 11, sex has to be mind blowing every time. This is not actually true. Sometimes it might be mind blowing. Sometimes it might not. You roll with it. It's everything is basically a learning experience for you and your partner. Sometimes it can just blow your socks off. Sometimes it's just on a scale of one to 10, it's like a five. Sometimes the man might not even get an erection. Please understand this, that sometimes men don't get erection. If it's something that happens occasionally, it's not something to be worried about. But if it's something that happens with in your hand, then you can now look into, oh, can we see a doctor? Can we see a therapist or something like that? But if it happens once in a while, it's not a big deal. Please understand that. Because if you then make it a big deal, guess what? Performance anxiety will set in and it then becomes like a vicious cycle. Because if a man has issues with his erection today, that is not necessarily a big deal. And you make a big deal out of, yeah, what happened? Hey, I hope you're not having a problem or one thing, one thing. And then the guy starts to think, oh, maybe I'm having a problem. The next time you want to have sex, his mind is already thinking, is this thing going to happen again? And guess what? Anxiety has set in and it will reverse the body's arousal process. Because when you are anxious, when you are in flight or flight mode, your, your brain and your body will take, I mean, blood from where it doesn't, from where it doesn't need to be. So if you're anxious, your blood, blood doesn't have to be in your penis. You don't need blood in your penis when you're anxious. So guess what? The blood will be taken away from the penis to where it needs to be. And it becomes like a vicious cycle over and over and over again. So what I'm trying to say is that sex, let's just normalize the fact that it probably won't be mind blowing every time. Yes, it's good to go for, to want to have it to be great. It's good, but let's just normalize the fact that it won't be mind blowing every time. There are people that have worked with me that have this misconception. It's amazing how this misconception can change a lot of things. I mean, people have worked with me, they think sex should be mind blowing every time. So what they do is, they allow time to pass because they also think that when they have sex every time, it might not be so great. So they allow time to pass, maybe like one or two weeks, and then they now have sex again, maybe like once every two weeks because they feel, oh, if that build up has happened, it will be great again. It will be mind blowing, but it just deprives you. That mindset just deprives you of a lot of things. Understand, just have it at the back of your mind that there will always be a next time to make it better there will always be a next time. So if it's not mind blowing today, it might be mind blowing tomorrow. There will always be a next time. So please understand that sex does not have to be mind blowing every time. So number 12, um, I think Christian even talked about this earlier. Pornography is, um, people thinking that pornography is sex education. Pornography is not sex education. Unfortunately, we're in a society where there is no adequate sex education given to people, teenagers, young adults and even adults, no adequate sex education. So people turn to pornography and guess what? Pornography is, move, it's a movie. Do you realize that they will cut and join, cut and join, cut and join? They'll have to say, cut, they'll go back again, come back, they'll join again. And by the time they, they put it together, everything becomes a movie that is like one hour long. And you are, you are thinking in your mind, hey God, how can I, take this woman for one hour. I have a lot of men come to me to ask me questions like, how can I last for hours? How can I last for one hour in bed? You don't need to, you don't need to. Please, pornography is not a proper representation of what real sex is, yeah? And some of these people that even act these movies are on stimulants. And so you will see their penises erect throughout. Please understand that that is not the standard. We don't, we, women don't actually need men to trust for one hour before they enjoy sex. It's not true, please. We don't necessarily need all of those things that you see in pornography. You don't have to turn the woman upside down. You don't have to fold her like um, a pretzel or break her like having biscuits for you to enjoy sex, please. Pornography is not an adequate representation of what sex should be. Sex is mutual pleasure. Sex is about communication. It's about connection. As a matter of fact, pornography doesn't even really show you the build up. 
some of them may even have storyline but guess what storyline you just come inside oh just see somebody like somebody next thing you're on the bed having sex there's no build up there are no emotions there but in actual in reality sex also has to do with emotions pornography doesn't show you the real thing it's just a fantasy that they want people to intend they intentionally want people to aspire to so they can make money and you can keep buying please pornography is not adequate sex education I, I, I mean, in fact, I saw something, somebody posted something a while ago. The person said, if you have sex with a woman and she's able to stand up and walk, then you have failed as a man. Please, you have not failed as a man. It's not, sex is not accident, please. It is not, you don't have to break our back. You don't have to put us in coma for you to know that you've done the right thing. Please, team womb shifters, please, we don't need you shifting any wounds because it can be painful, please. So pornography is actually not adequate sex education. It's not accurate. Those things are movies, they are scripted. They have cut it, they have joined it, they have taken different takes and put everything together. And you are now watching it and putting yourself under the pressure to perform the way they have. Please, pornography is not adequate sex education. Myth number 13, the bigger the penis, the more pleasurable sex is for the woman. Okay, so again, it's, I, I mean, I, I recently did this, I did a poll on this recently, and a lot of women said they were more interested in how the man used his penis as opposed to the size of the penis. And you know what is even amazing? Men, a lot of men that have small penises make up for it amazingly because they know that, okay, okay, I don't really have a big penis and all of that, or I have a small penis, or I have, or I feel like I don't have what to work with they're able to make up for it outside of intercourse. They have specialized in that area to kind of make up for the big penises they don't have. But the truth is that we don't actually, a lot of women don't actually need big penises. Some do, please understand this, some do, but not all. So when people ask me this question, what I say is talk to your woman and ask her, does she enjoy bigger penises or not? Or for her, is it about the skill? Because most women have said is how you use it. You, are, you know, you, are even, if you can even bring a woman to orgasm, pleasure, sexual pleasure, even without putting your penis anywhere near her vulva or even inside a vagina. You won't even have put your penis anywhere near her. The woman can, could, could even have multiple orgasms. Please, there's a lot more to sexual pleasure, especially for women, than just penis. So we don't need a penis that looks like a tuba of yam to enjoy sex. We don't need womb shifters gang to enjoy sex, please. So whatever penis size you have, know how to use it, know how to make it pleasurable for her and for yourself. And of course, like I, I think I've said this before, everybody is unique in the way they receive pleasure. Understand how your woman receives pleasure and your penis size will not be a problem. Number 14. Yeah, this is interesting. So um, too much sex, a lot of people think that too much sex causes women to have a loose vagina. It's not true. You cannot, the vagina does not have a meter. You cannot put a penis inside and know that, oh, her, 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 her vagina is loose, and so therefore she must have had one million sexual partners. No. What causes a woman to have a loose vagina? And I don't like to use the word loose. I like to say well-toned, or it's a vagina that is not well-toned. What causes a woman to have a vagina that is not well-toned are things like age, childbirth, pregnancy, obesity, and what have you. What usually, what really happens is that the, um, um, the pelvic floor muscles that kind of surround the vagina. So the, the pelvic floor muscles bond around the vagina. So if you say, when, when they say a woman has a loose vagina, what you are trying to say is actually that she has weak pelvic floor muscles. And that has nothing to do with sex. Your pelvic floor muscles can weaken as you age, can weaken with pregnancy, with childbirth, obesity and what have you, but not with too much sex. So the trick is to ensure that your pelvic floor muscles are well toned. If your pelvic floor muscles are well toned, your vagina is well toned. And a very simple way to do this is to do Kegel exercise. I know a lot of us have heard Kegel, 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 but there is more result in the doing than the hearing. It sounds like such a simple thing to say. It sounds like such a simple solution, but the truth is that it works. Kegel exercises work, but people don't really do it. People think that this thing might really work, but people don't do it. So there's, there's no, knowledge is different from execution. Kegel exercises can help to strengthen your pelvic floor muscles. 
So it is not so much sex that will cause women to have a loose vagina or anything like that. It is when the pelvic floor muscles are weak. If the pelvic floor muscles are weak, then what happens is that our, our, those muscles are not well toned. And when the penis goes in, it basically just gives way. But when your pelvic floor muscles are well toned, then it translates to what we call a femme or well toned vagina. Finally, and um, finally, this is the last myth. Using lubricants during sex is unnatural. That's not true. Using lubricants during sex is, is fine. It's absolutely fine. Because sometimes, I mean, when you, when you talk about vaginal lubrication, there are a lot of things that can affect a woman's vaginal lubrication. Her hormones, for instance. A woman who is breastfeeding, for instance, um, might, might have, um, because she's, um, what's, what's, that, what's that hormone? Because her body is releasing prolactin, it can interfere with the production of estrogen. And estrogen is responsible for vaginal lubrication. So a, lot, a host of other things, even birth control, hormones or what have you can interfere with how a woman produces her own vaginal lubrication. But if for some reason she is unable to produce vaginal lubrication, please don't just try to force the penis in because you think lube is unnatural. It might be painful for her. It might actually be injurious to her. Using lubricants have been designed specifically to be used in the vagina. So it is designed specifically for the vagina. Using lubricants is fine. That's the purpose it was made for. If for some reason a woman's natural lubrication is unable to kick in, please don't try to go in dry and force yourself in like that. Use a lubricant to help her um, enjoy the process as well. As a matter of fact, some women find that using lubricants can even help to um, kickstart their own vaginal lubrication. Because some women, they might not actually have the interest for sex, because that's another thing that will affect a woman's lubrication. If she doesn't have the interest for sex, she will not be lubricated because her body hasn't sent that response to her brain. Do you understand? Her brain has not received the response for arousal, so she won't be lubricated. But you, some women find that when they use lubricants, when they get into that process of intercourse or sex and what have you, they begin to get aroused. And so using lubricant as, as, at the start even helps their own body's natural lubrication to kick in. So please, using lubricants is very, very natural and it is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. They're designed exactly for that purpose. So um, basically, I'm going to just round up by saying this. Changing and correcting your sexual belief changes how you approach sex. It just changes everything. Redefining sex for yourself, getting to know your partner better, removing performance anxiety, anxiety to meet certain standards or, or, or um, holding yourself to certain rigid standards that you think that sex should be, you know, can just affect how you enjoy sex and how you approach sex. So correcting those beliefs can change everything when it comes to sex. And so I round off my presentation. My name is Ola Amiesson, sex therapist and coach. To know more about what I do, you can visit my website, www.olaamiesson.com. Excuse me, if you want to check out some of our courses, because I have a um, university of sex where we house sex courses for people, you can watch and learn. You can go to uos.olaamiesson.com, that's the university of sex. And you can check me out on social media, on Instagram or Twitter, at Olaamiesson. Thank you so much for having me here. I hope that with these few words of mine, I've been able to convince you that some sexual beliefs or myths might be affecting how you perceive sex and they should be changed. Thank you. Hello, Christian. Hello, can I ask a question? Yes, please. I want to stop sharing. Yeah, my name is, my name is, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I sent a message to you, uh, but I didn't get any feedback from you. Uh, my name is Sonex. I'm calling from, um, chatting from Nigeria, Lagos, precisely. Okay. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, yes, it's better now. Please go ahead. Uh oh. Can't see anything.
So um, I'm, I can't hear you anymore. I don't know who was, someone was trying to ask a question. Um, so I can't really hear you. I'm not hearing you again. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Okay, I think yes, it's better now. Yes, this is someone else. My name is Adam from Lagos. I don't, but yes, I dropped two questions on the comment box. Um, okay. Thank you. What's the question, please? Is um okay. The the last one is how healthy is masturbation? Masturbation. Okay. okay. So there's a question on masturbation, right? How healthy is masturbation? So okay, when it comes to the physiology of it, there's actually nothing wrong with masturbation. Masturbation will not make you go blind. It will not make you grow hair and what have you. It's there's nothing wrong with it. It's self exploration. Now, what could be problematic is if you become addicted to it if there's excessive masturbation, that could be a problem because any addiction of any sort at all is problematic because we define addiction as um, things that can affect your own sexual, not just your sexual functioning, even your personal, your life, your, your social functioning, your person, anything, any behavior that begins to control you, any behavior that you cannot control and that begins to control you and interferes with your own daily functioning. Do you understand? So masturbating here and there is not a bad thing. Physiologically, it doesn't have any dangers. But if it becomes excessive and that behavior begins to drive you as you've been able to control mm -hmm. it, then it becomes a problem. If it begins to affect your relationship, it could become a problem. Now, another issue in masturbation is that for a lot of people, when they masturbate, they become used to a certain kind of stimulation. Do you understand? They become yeah. used to a certain kind of stimulation. So it then becomes difficult to transition into partnered sex and enjoy, enjoy stimulation with their partner because over time they have become accustomed to stroking themselves a particular way. But aside that, there are no physiological um, consequences of masturbation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay. The other question was, um, what's your take on sex enhancement drugs? Is that possible? Okay, so um, <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a psychologist, I do not, I'm not even licensed to even prescribe sexual enhancement drugs to people because one, um, aside from the fact that I'm not licensed, I also have concerns about them because a lot of us don't know the components of these drugs. There are a lot of people selling drugs, Chinese herbs, even people in Nigeria put herbs together and say, use it, drink it, and what have you. They don't know the components of these things. And we don't know the underlying issues that a, that a person can have. Excuse me. So we don't know the underlying issues that a person can have. So we don't, we don't also know that if you drink this, it cannot trigger something. It cannot trigger an underlying issue that has just been latent. Do you understand? So I'm very, very wary of sex enhancement drugs. When it comes to sex enhancement, what I usually ask is, what are you trying to achieve? And is this something that psychosexual therapy can help you to achieve? Do you understand? So I'm not a proponent or an advocate of sexual enhancement drugs or herbs or anything like that. I would also, I would, thank you for allowing me. Sorry, I got uh, thrown out a bit by the network. I'd also okay. add to that, like what she said about um, the components is very, very important. I think beyond using sexual enhancers, if you are healthy, if you are in a good state of health, you're physically fit, you would most likely not need any of those enhancers. Another thing is some of the myths you addressed, you don't need to have um, penet penetrative sex for one hour, like you, you don't need to kill yourself. So once you are not trying to fulfill any of those unreal expectations and you are healthy, you are fit, then you would actually need any of these um, enhancers, actually. So thank you. I just wanted to add to that. Okay. Thank you. So do we have any other questions? Yes, someone asked a question. Um, unfortunately, I got bounced out, so I don't have it. But if I recollect the question, he said something about being um, newly married. He married as a he married as a um, virgin, and that he's having. He noticed that he doesn't last more than five minutes, and that whenever he tries to 
like whenever he's stimulated afterwards, um, mm-hmm. he feels pain. I, I think what I got from that question was probably um, after the five minutes, maybe a hand job or something mm-hmm. without maybe proper lubrication. That mm-hmm. may be what's causing the pain. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also I, shed more light on that. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. If that's what he said, is also because it's amazing that a lot of people give hand jobs without using lubricants. They don't use lube. They just use their dry hands. It will be painful. There is nothing to ease and to make it slippery or slide the way a vagina would. Do you understand? And so it will be painful. If that person is being stimulated with the dry hand, it makes sense that it will be painful. So um, if he's newly wet, I, I mean, some things I would like to know is how, how many times has he tried to and experienced um, this issue? Because honestly, if that is even his first time of having sex, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I said this, it's not necessarily an issue, but if you make it an issue, it can become a bigger issue. So the way, um, I, I can't see the question, but it's highly likely that someone like that is already dealing with performance anxiety and performance anxiety would automatically make it worse. Do you understand? Performance anxiety will automatically make it worse. So first of all, we need to understand a bit of history. How many times has, has this happened for us to understand what exactly is going on with him? But some of the easy things that he can do without being able to assess um, what exactly is going on with him deeply or fully is what we call the stop and start method. So penetrating, having when you have intercourse, penetrate to a point and stop. When, don't allow yourself to get to the point of no return where your orgasm is in it, where your where ej- ejaculation is inevitable. When you know that your arousal level is building, stop. You can come out, and then after a while, when your arousal level has receded to a level, you can go back in again. Now, there's also the squeeze method when the man is close to ejaculation, that the woman can, you know, apply pressure on the head of his penis. Apply some pressure, nothing painful, please, on the head of his penis. Some people also like to use condoms to, to I mean, to desensitize a bit so that they don't feel that as much sensation as they would feel if they were going in without condoms. Some people also use numbing creams. So use numbing creams before, clean it off so that the vagina doesn't also get numb when the penis goes inside. So some of those, and some people also try to um, masturbate first. So they ejaculate first before they actually go into penetration. Some people find that by that time, they have a bit more longer time to have sex. So it's more sustained. But it would be also be interesting to understand how long this person has been dealing with this, how many times, and most importantly, if performance anxiety has set in, because that might even be the problem ultimately. Okay. So there, there was another question. Um, someone said, is having sex five times a day safe? Sorry? Is someone, someone asked a question like, um, having sex, rough sex. He said roughly. Okay, okay, okay. I think he means masturbation five times a day. Like, is it safe? Um, I think you already dealt with it by talking about yeah. addictions and um, just not being too used to anything. So yeah. I, I, another question someone asked was about pain during intercourse. Okay. Is this a woman or a man? Um, I, most likely a woman. I can't, I will have to check the, I'm looking at the forms because okay. people also filled in some questions in the forms. Oh, just... all right, all right. So you can't really tell the sex. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So basically, um, um, like you said, it's most likely a lady. Um, so like I said before, um, women have to get to that point of pleasurable penetration because that is when the body is actually ready to receive the penis. If the vagina has not expanded, if it has not um, lubricated, if cervical, if vaginal tension has not occurred, if the cervix hasn't moved up to create more room, it's possible that it's highly likely that she would experience pain. So she, I mean, where she also experienced pain is, is also important. Is it at the entrance when it's trying to penetrate? Is it when it's inside? Because some people experience pain when the penis is inside and touching the cervix. Do you understand? So if vaginal tension has occurred, most, most times that shouldn't be a problem. If the problem is also pain at the entrance, you need to also ensure that it's lubricated. Are they lubricating properly? Do you understand? So some of these questions, honestly, it helps to have a bit of context. I, I can prefer general solutions, but it helps to have a bit of context to be able to actually address what the person needs. But 
Yeah, in terms of pain upon penetration, it's good that the woman is properly and adequately lubricated before the man um, actually penetrates the vagina. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we, we've shut our time a bit. So we'll be rounding off now. Thank you very much. Allow me thank for you the so presentation. Much. Just to take a few, a few more questions. Just I would address them directly. Someone asked about um, um, what can be done to increase the length and thickness of the penis. I would tell you that once you're say between 19, around 19, say 21, but most times around 19, um, whatever your penis is like is what it will be for life. So you can't increase the length or increase the girth. That's how um, thick it is. So yeah. all those screams, there's something I saw put on social media that was very insightful. We said, if you are rubbing um, penis enlargement creams and your hand is not getting bigger, but the cream is getting bigger, <laughs> but you should know that <laughs> something is not working yeah. somewhere. So we, yeah. we have a lot of questions, yeah. but so for the sake Kristen, of time. Just to say what you, just to add to what you said, Again, a lot, because it's because a lot of us have this penis-focused approach to sex. Do you understand? There's so many ways to give pleasure outside of just having a bigger penis. Do you understand? There's so many ways to give your... Because for someone to want to have a bigger penis, it makes sense that what he thinks, that is what will satisfy his woman. Yeah? There are so many other ways to express sexual pleasure beyond having a penis. Women... I mean, research has shown us that 70 to 75% of women who orgasm with via clitoral stimulation, that's what research has shown us. 70 to 75% women orgasm only when clitoral stimulation is involved. So imagine that. It means that even without the penis going inside, a woman is capable of achieving orgasm. So again, the focus on penetration needs to probably be redirected so that the, the, I mean, couples can explore what is really pleasurable to them as opposed to what they think should be. Okay. Thank you, allow me just to chip in something else. Um, I think one of the most, in fact, I would say the most important component in maintaining your sexual health is actually your physical health, like your overall health. And, and stay, staying healthy, staying healthy, if you have um, chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, they can affect your sexual um, performance if you are not getting appropriate treatment. So I would say that one way to stay healthy is by actually going to the hospital regularly and ensuring that you are, you are, you are in a, the right state of mind and state of health. And to do that, that's one of the things we give access to at um, Hygia HMO because we give access to wholesome and comprehensive health services. Um, I'll just talk a bit about some of our plans. I think that's the final thing we have for today before we um, close up. And then I think people may still have more questions for you and for Sanasi. So um, we would also share the slides. We'll share the slides and we'll also share your um, contacts and addresses for people that want to maybe follow up with um, you um, personally. And apart from that, we also have um, access to, we also give access to wholesome healthcare through our Hygia Health Plans. I'll talk about two. I'll talk about the High Prime Plan and the um, High Prime Plus. The, the High Prime Plan is about 69,000 in a year, and it gives you access to healthcare worth 1.3 million in, within that time frame. So that covers general consultations, um, surgeries, covers diagnostic services and imaging, covers inpatient care, covers physiotherapy, telemedicine, dental care, um, family planning, and mental health, chronic, uh, mental health care is also covered, and critical illness as well. So what this means is that if you're having some of these sexual challenges that you may not be able to address within the confines of your bedroom, I think it starts from going to the hospital to seek care, and then from there you get referred to the appropriate people who can handle your situation. So it's very important that you key into health plans like this. We also have the Health Prime Plus, which gives you um, access to benefits about over 1.8 million when you buy the plan of 385,000 in a year. And it covers consultations, surgeries, diagnostic services, um, accommodation, that is inpatient care, physiotherapy, telemedicine. So you can see the doctor from the comfort of your home, dental care, as well, uh, family planning, 
um, mental health services, chronic disease management, and as well as critical illness as well. So these plans are some of our plans that we offer, which will be beneficial to you in the long run. If you have a young family, you can key into any of our family plans as well. So um, if you want to find out more about Hygiea's health plans and packages, um, as a foremost HMO in Nigeria, you can simply reach out to us through any of our through any of our um, contact lists or um, contact addresses that will be dropped in the chat box. Um, for the questions people are asking now, one thing we'll do is that we'll address or we'll address all questions subsequently. If you look out for our blog and follow us on social media. We'll also be addressing some of these questions you've listed and you've asked in the um, mailbox when you're registering and you've asked on this um, chat as well during the course of the presentation. So thank you very much, Allow Me. Thank you very much, um, Sanasi. Thank you everyone for joining. We hope that this has been um, helpful in some way and that you've learned a thing or two about um, managing your sexual health and optimizing it. Um, of course, um, sexual health is not something that can be trashed within two hours. The, the issues are wide ranging. So hopefully, or just keep on the, looking out for our posts on these issues on social media and on our blog. That's just check hijahmo.com and then you can visit our blog and just look out for them. And um, for those that have their emails with us already, we'll send out the recording and um, the slides as well so thank you very much everyone thank you very much um, this has been a very wonderful learning experience um, i can see your question and would we'll address that question as well grace subsequently um, thank you very much everyone have a lovely weekend thank you everyone all right. This is for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for training. Continue to live more life.